Now he has something to say here to them. He says, I know your works. This is verses 9 and 10. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Now, there's seven things here that he says to this church, and these are the things the Lord commended in the church. He mentions tribulation first. Actually, works are not in the best manuscript here, and I personally have left it out. If you want to include it, fine. But tribulation here is that we need to understand. Of course, it's not the great tribulation. It's trouble. And since the awful persecution of the church by the Roman emperors is not called the great tribulation, surely our small sufferings that we are enduring today couldn't be called the great tribulation. So that they were suffering for Christ. And the second thing, that he commended them for their poverty. And he denotes their lack of material possessions. You know, the early church was made up largely of the poorer classes. When the wealthy believed their property was confiscated because of their faith. He says, but thou art rich. And that denotes the spiritual wealth of the church. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. And notice the contrast here to the church in Laodicea. We'll come to it later. But the church in Laodicea was rich. But our Lord said, you're really poor and you don't know it. I get rather amused about this. And I speak in several places where there are conferences. And they like to tell me that there are several millionaires in the congregation. And I'm glad they tell me that because I'm sure never found it out any other way. You'd never know it by their support of the Through the Bible radio program, I can assure you. Well, anyway, they like to speak of prominent people that are members of their church or rich people that are members of the church. You know, the early church, this martyr church couldn't brag about that. They had slaves in there, ex-slaves, runaway slaves, freed slaves, poor people, Not any in there that is rich, not many that had property. He also says that there were Jews outwardly. You know, there's only been a remnant down through the years of these people that have truly been God's people. Paul says all Israel is not Israel. The thing that makes the Jew a Jew and actually makes him one that belongs to the nation Israel... It's his religion. That is the thing that identifies him. Actually, he was a Syrian. That's what the Lord said to him. A Syrian ready to perish was my father. That was a picture of him. That's what he was nationally. That's what he was racially. But now they had denied their religion. And though they might say they're Jews, actually, when a Jew gives up his religion, There's a question whether he's a Jew or not. And in Germany, many tried to do that, by the way. Now, Smyrna was a city of culture in which many Jews had discarded their belief in the Old Testament. It was a very wealthy city from the very word go, and it is today. And the fourth thing, he says, fear nothing. That's the encouragement of the Lord to his own in the midst of persecution. This is the second time in this book that the Lord has offered this encouragement. History tells us that multitudes went to their death singing praises to God. Then the fifth thing, it says the devil and Satan. They're the same person. And we're going to look at this fearful creature later on. But Christ labels him as being responsible for the suffering of the saints. We tend to blame the immediate person or circumstance which serves as Satan's tool. 
But the Lord Jesus goes back to the root trouble. Very frankly, if I may inject a personal word, in my book, Why Do God's Children Suffer?, I could classify and pigeonhole everything that had come to me under the different ways. God judged me. God chastened me. But this last act was puzzled. And quite a few people began to write in and said, We believe Satan is responsible. And that, I think, is the explanation of reason I've had so many physical problems. Now, the sixth thing that he mentioned here, you'll have tribulation ten days. There were ten intense periods of persecution by ten Roman emperors. And I want to mention those. I think it's important. First, there was Nero from 64 to 68 A.D. And Paul was beheaded under the reign of Nero. Then Domitian from 95 to 96. And he was lots worse than Nero. And John was exiled during that period. And then Trajan, 104 to 117, and Ignatius was burned at the stake. And then Marcus Aurelius, 161 to 180, and Polycarp was martyred in that period. Then there was Severus, and I won't give dates, but Maximinius, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, and then finally Diocletian, 303 to 313. He was the worst emperor of all. Now, here you have these ten Roman emperors that led in an awful persecution of Christians. Now, the seventh thing that he mentions here, they were faithful unto death. That means they were martyred. Now, he says he's going to give them a crown of life. And this is a special crown for those who suffer. It's quite interesting that the Lord has special crowns. And I know a lot of wonderful saints that are going to get that crown someday. And I'd like to just say that to so many people that are listening today. You're on a bed of pain, or you may be an invalid, and you've wondered, well, he's got something good for you someday. You're going to get something that no one else will be getting except those in your group. James had said this. If you recall back in James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation or testing. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And that crown of life means you're going to really live it up someday. My friend, what a glorious thing's in prospect for you folk at a day that are invalids or on beds of pain or sickness. May God bless you. (laughs) My, what a glorious thing. It's in prospect here. Now he says in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Always he says that. Do you hear him? Is he speaking to you? He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I think Dwight L. Moody put it like this. He that is born once will have to die twice. He that's born twice will only die once, and he may not even have to die that one time. And he'll not be hurt of the second death, and that is the death that no believer will experience. The first death concerns the body. The second death is the soul and spirit, eternal separation from God. That's what it means. No believer will have to undergo that. 